Good evening and welcome to the CUNE Academy for part two of Federalism in the Courts, where we're building responsible voters one video at a time. All right, we left off with NLRB versus Jones, Laughlin, Steele and the minimum wage essentially being ruled constitutional. Okay, um, now that's a more of a confusing and difficult case to understand. Here's a pretty easy one. And this actually was a precedent case in the health care uh, debate from last summer. OK, um, which was the Affordable Care Act being held, upheld as constitutional. Now, what happened in this case is in Wickard versus Filburn is you have a farmer who is challenging the constitutionality of the AAA, that is the Agricultural Adjustment Act, hopefully you remember from U.S. history last year. And he's arguing that Congress cannot limit how much grain he gets to grow um, because his grain is not interstate commerce. Okay, What happened was he was allotted by the government 150 acres of land to grow grain to, um, um, for sale. Okay. Well, he decided he was going to grow an extra three acres or so of grain all right, on his property. All right? Now, the reason Congress was limiting it was if you limit how much you produce, it's going to increase the cost and, um, and demand, which is going to help the farmers out. Okay. But he wanted to grow more. So he wanted to grow another three acres to feed his cattle. Government came in and fined him saying, sorry, you can't grow this. You're only allowed to grow 150 acres. And he argued that I am going to be growing this in New York. I'm going to be feeding it to my cattle in New York, selling it in New York. There's no interstate commerce involved, all right? Open and shut case should easily rule in favor of the farmer. However, the court ruled, and this is a true story, okay? The court ruled that if he had been following the law, all right, and doing what he was supposed to do and only growing his 150 acres, all right, to get that additional feed for his pigs, cattle, etc., okay, he would have had to have bought it. And therefore, it was implied that it would have been interstate commerce had he been following the rules and Congress can regulate it. Okay, so they upheld another one of FDR's policies. So you can start to see after the court packing, the court starts to find ways to find these things to be unconstitutional, even if it's thinking outside the box. So they essentially set the precedent that if it would be interstate commerce, we can regulate it, even though you're not actually involved in interstate commerce. So what it's done is broken down all the differences between intra within the state and inter between the state commerce. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, but that becomes a key precedent later on. All right. 1964, Civil Rights Act of 1964 is uh, ruled on in 1964 by the um, Supreme Court. And it's an interesting case of Hard Atlanta Motel versus United States. Now, we know the Civil Rights Act of 64 broke down the walls of segregation, all right? Uh, ended segregation and any kind of public accommodations. So the Heart of Atlanta Motel sued, arguing that that violated, believe it or not, their 13th Amendment rights. Now you're like, 13th Amendment, that abolished slavery, right? Yes. He was saying that it was involuntary servitude to have to admit African Americans into his hotel, and therefore he should not have to follow the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in surprisingly, a 9-0 decision, the Supreme Court said that the act was constitutional because it was interstate commerce and Congress can regulate that. So because of the Commerce Clause, the um, Civil Rights Act was upheld and more rights were granted. All right. Now, looking into the future, you're going to miss a question on our Unit 4 test about civil rights when we ask about the Commerce Clause, but he can save that one for later. Okay, let's hope you don't miss it. All right, the U.S. versus Lopez, all right, uh, 1995. I know the dates are, are off here, but it was argued in one year and ruled on another year. Okay, you're reading this for homework tonight, at least one of your partners is. And this one is the first case since 1937 where the Fe Supreme Court says enough is enough. Okay. This is about the Guns Free School Zone Act, all right? And this was basically said it as a federal crime to bring a gun within 500 feet of a school. Makes perfect sense, right? However, the court ruled, okay, um, or the challenge was that this was not interstate commerce, okay? There's no business from between the states happening with, uh, with right bringing a gun to school, okay? Now, obviously, the Second Amendment comes into play here, but Congress is saying, well, we're using the Commerce Clause to regulate this because, after all, if you bring a gun to school, that's going to hurt property values. People are going to move out of state, all right? Teachers aren't going to want to teach there. It's, it's things that we can regulate, okay? And every time they've used the Commerce Clause argument up until then, it had been totally ruled constitutional, so they figured this was a no-brainer. And the court, in a very narrow ruling, five to four, said that, no, the Commerce Clause does not apply. And if the Commerce Clause is going to apply, it has to be literal commerce. There has to be actual transactions between the state lines taking place for the Commerce Clause to apply. So it's the first time that they have limited the use of the, um, 
of the Commerce Clause and Congress's uh, and Congress's powers there, okay? And it starts to shift back to more state powers and more states' rights. And there's a nice list in your book of cases that have been declared unconstitutional since 1995, all right? Um, now this came up, uh, you're gonna probably talk about this in class today, uh, I plan to, because um, I'm recording it in the morning. Uh, but U.S. versus Morrison also struck down an act of Congress, which was called the Violence Against Women's Act. It basically made it a federal crime to commit a violent act against a woman. And somebody sued and said that's not federal jurisdiction. They can't regulate it. Congress said, well, it's interstate commerce. If you, you know, harm your wife or you harm your girlfriend, she's going to move out of state. That's going to affect business. We can regulate it. And the court again said under the Lopez precedent that it has to be in actual literal commerce. Now, that law was re-upped last year, so I'm not really sure. i got to research that a little bit more, how that eventually passed the Constitution test. They might have used a different clause other than the Commerce Clause in order to pass it, but um, it was declared unconstitutional in 2000. So these are two cases limiting the federal government's rights um, after 1993. And then to confuse things a little bit, we have two cases in 2006 of Gonzalez versus Raich and Gonzalez versus Oregon. Gonzalez was the U.S. Attorney General at the time, so that's why his name is attached to both of these cases. Um, and in the one case, the court ruled that in Gonzalez versus Raich that medicinal marijuana was considered interstate commerce. Okay, um, because what happened here is this woman in California was growing it for medicinal purposes. She argued it's growing in California, I'm smoking in California, there's no interstate commerce involved. And the court ruled back to 1942 as a precedent case, they used the Wickard as the precedent case to say that if this woman was growing it um, the way she was supposed to, which it's against the law to grow marijuana, um, <clears throat> then she would have had to have got it from Mexico because in Mexico it's a little easier to get drugs there. So if she would have got it in Mexico, it would have been interstate commerce and therefore Congress can regulate it. So it's They've actually upheld a congressional act of Congress. You really see some hypocrisy on the part of the judges here because some of the judges that were in favor of states' rights totally went in favor of the federal government and reversed their stance on the Commerce Clause, in this case probably because they were opposed to marijuana use. And then Gonzalez versus Oregon was an assisted suicide case, and in this case they said that it was not interstate commerce to do assisted suicide and ruled in favor of the states. Okay, so Oregon could continue its assisted suicide policies, and Congress could not regulate that. So a lot of confusion and contradiction there. And then the Affordable Care Act case from last year, we'll close with that, basically was held constitutional, but they did not want to use the Commerce Clause, because that's how Congress argued they could force you to have health insurance, was that it was a... Um, that it was interstate commerce and that uh, it would affect that. But then people argued, well, it's not interstate commerce because I'm not buying insurance. That's not commerce. Um, and the court sidestepped that one and instead ruled it to be a tax. And Congress has the power to tax, so therefore they would penalize you financially if you didn't have health insurance. All right, so I hope that helps a little bit. We'll talk about the cases a little more in detail on, when, on Thursday, and we're going to debate the uh, mar recreational marijuana use um, and whether or not the Commerce Clause would apply in that particular area. So thanks for listening to the CUNE Academy, where we're building responsible voters one video at a time. We'll see you on Friday.